our under understanding for Americans are like they're all very wild. In China, men just pay for everything. Definitely before 35, they want to have families, kids, wife. How old do you have to be then as a woman to be considered a leftover? Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Dating Beyond Borders podcast. Today, I'm excited to welcome on the show Victoria, a Chinese creator who lives in the US and shares some fascinating tidbits around Chinese culture and Chinese dating scene. We will talk about how Chinese approach the conversation about sex to what makes you a marriageable girl in China to the social clock for men and women in China and to the Chinese marriage market. So welcome mm. to the show, Victoria. Yay. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Marina. Yes. I, I love your Instagram. I love the format that you do. I love the tidbits that I get every day from you. I've been <laughs> tuned in for a while now and I'm like, oh, let me click on this. What makes okay. you a marriageable girl in China? So I'm, I'm excited to talk about it to you today. Mm -hmm. um, so tell me a little bit about your, your story. You grew up in China and then you moved to the U.S. for school, correct? Yeah, yeah. I was born and raised in China for 18 years and then I moved to the U.S. for college and I've been like living in the U.S. for six years now. So it's been quite a long time, to be honest. Yeah. And where are you from in China? So I was originally like my hometown where my parents come from. It's a city in the co it's a coastal city called Wenzhou. And we're actually known to be the Oriental Jews because we're so good at doing business. And <laughs> then uh, our family moved to Shanghai. So I was also like um, lived in Shanghai and educated and go to school in Shanghai for a long time. Yeah. And now where do you live in the U.S.? I live in New York City right now. Okay, so how was that? I mean, moving from China to the US, did you experience any big culture shocks? Yeah, totally. Because I think from my understanding before in China, um, because our understanding for Americans are like, they're all very wild. And I think that's definitely one of the culture shocks because I think they are wild. <laughs> Uh, when I go to a U.S. college, obviously, I went to Berkeley, so everyone is super liberal, love to go to a lot of demonstrations, which are very different because in China, we don't really talk about politics in China, and we don't go to demonstrations, and I think that's a def definitely a big culture shock, and besides that, I think we don't do small talks, like, I, I definitely feel, like, very uncomfortable doing small talks. Uh, when I first came to the U.S. because people just ask you about everything and like you have to introduce them. What's your name? And like, how's your day? Like, and they would just start chatting with you when you go to like, you know, just go get a coffee at Starbucks. So I think that's definitely part of the biggest culture shock because in China, we don't really like to talk with strangers. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It's interesting that you say Americans are kind of wild in college, but it, it, where did the stereotype come about? Was it from watching American movies and just seeing like the parties and the frat houses? Yeah, totally. <laughs> from, I think from American Pie, <laughs> like the movie. So it's definitely, we all think like, you know, Americans are wild, but I was in a sorority at Berkeley. So it's very different from what I watch in the movie, but definitely some similarities, but I think in general, like it's quite different. Yeah. What What's the difference between the, the sorority that you see in movies and in, in real life? I think in real life, especially at Berkeley. So everyone is super like studious and all the girls in my sorority, they all have like just and like chemical engineering or like they study for pre-med, they study pretty hard. Like party is only like a very small part of their life. But like in the movies, it feels like, oh, like American kids, American college kids do nothing but party and all they care about is getting laid or something. <laughs> so it's not like Legally Blonde, you tell me. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's quite different because I definitely feel like a lot of the smart kids in the US, they study hard, but they also party. Like they do found a balance in their lives. But like, unlike the Chinese kids, I think we only study like when we grow up. So there's hardly any balance in that. Yeah, I love watching your reels because you have one recurring theme through all of the reels. And that is you mm -hmm. need to study, you need to get good grades. And yeah. 
I'm really interested to get your perspective on this from someone who is raised in China. Um, I've worked a lot with Chinese kids. I used to teach English online. Mm -hmm. And I definitely have noticed that when I was teaching kids, I would ask, what do you like to do in your spare time? What are your hobbies? And a lot of times the kids had no hobbies. They would just say like, oh, I like to sleep and then I have to study. And it was really disturbing for me because the kid is like six years old and yeah. they have no hobbies. And I don't know, all they do is sleep and, and study and then they do English classes and they, they do extracurricular classes and this and this and this. So I would love to hear your kind of experience growing up in that. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I feel like I'm that kid. <laughs> Yeah, because <laughs> uh, yeah, totally. I think I don't know. I feel like growing up, I was always studying, and I hardly go to any parties, even like my friends' birthday parties on the weekends. If I have a class I need to go to, like during the weekends, I would just go to class. My parents would never like cancel a class because of my friends having a birthday party. So it's definitely very different because I feel like I'm just always studying. So like when you um, when I think about other things like the hobbies, the hobbies are not really hobbies. They're more they're more like the things that you need to do to get into a good college, you know, just like doing extracurriculars in the U.S. But I was in the public school system for a long time, so I wasn't sure if I want to go to college in the U.S. for like 15 years of my life. So like I wasn't really, I don't know that I want to like go to the U.S. for college until high school uh, because high, in high school I went to an international school so everyone needs to go to like a foreign college so when I was in the public school system I think like we just value grades and all the hobbies like you know they're just for fun and to prepare you to do better in school and to get better grades you know it's more like uh, you just get to relax a little bit but like that's not your main goal and you don't have to give uh, shit about that <laughs> I have to say yeah so it's not about what you actually want to do like try out different things to see if you have any talent or if you you know mm -hmm. let's say you want to be a dancer it's more like okay this is the school that you're going to go to and these are the requirements and these are the extracurriculars you need uh, yeah. so learn how to do this and that and this it's all for yeah. like a future ahead of you it's not for fun yeah, because in China, like, if you tell your parents you want to be a dancer or, like, you want to be an artist, it's just bizarre for them, you know. They would think, like, if you want to be, like, an artist or dancer, you will just never earn money to support yourself and you will just end up in the street and no one will care for you <laughs> because they think, like, all the artists and dancers they see in their lives, they're not doing very well. Because all I think the artist and the music industry or like the dancing industry is just like a winner takes all market, especially in China. Only the very top, top artists and dancers can earn all the money. But the rest to the very traditional Chinese parents, they think like it's just um, it's just quite it doesn't seem like a decent job for them. So growing up, did you feel that pressure to succeed? Did, did that affect you in any way? Like looking back, are you kind of like. I wish I had more time to just be myself and figure out what I like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think totally. I always feel like the pressure that I need to be successful, even till today. And because I feel like a lot of the things that I learned throughout life is just you have to have a goal and achieve that. It's the same thing applies with you know go to going to a good college and having good grades. It's like you have to set a goal for yourself to go to which college that you want to go to and you achieve that through constantly studying. So, and I think parents, Chinese parents, my parents, they always have a very high expectations of me, which I think really stressed me out a lot of times, but I'm always, I think I'm pretty good with dealing with stress. I, I'm not a real, I'm not a perfectionist in any sense. So I don't really get stressed out that much, but I think reflecting back, I would definitely feel like there's always a pressure around around me. Yeah. Did you, uh, I guess, like when you had your friends in school, did you notice that some kids didn't handle the stress very well? Um, I know, for example, during exam times, my friend worked in China for, I think, eight years. She had mentioned that uh, around exam times, there's like quite a lot of suicides. I mean, not to start off on a really somber note, but uh, mm -hmm. that really, that really like resonated with me. And I was thinking, man, like, to commit to take your life just because of certain expectations like 
that mm -hmm. that's just such a i mean what would what what needs to happen for you to get to the point where you think i'd rather take my life than be a failure you know mm -hmm. i think personally i don't know anyone who suicided around me because um i just don't know and i definitely feel like a lot of a lot of kids in china they're um they're actually constantly facing the pressure of getting good grades and that's a fact but when i came to the us i also realized that the suicidal rate like the teenage suicidal rates in the us are higher than china and a lot of kids are having fun but they still want to take their lives so when i think about this issue i don't think about it as like a black or white question or like i definitely feel like we need to find a balance between western and eastern education and I definitely don't think that a Western, like a very typical Western education is, you know, good for kids' mental health as well as a very typical Eastern kind of education for kids. I don't agree with both of them. And I do believe that we need to find a balance between studying, having fun, looking for yourself and how to define success for yourself. And I think after I came to the US and after my college years, I definitely feel like a lot of times when we study, we don't know what we want in our life and we don't know who we are. And, and I think in the Chinese education system, it's really lacking the, that part, like just to teach your kids that you have to found yourself and you have to found your place in the world and you have to, you know, know who you are. And I think that part is definitely lacking. But I think in the Western education system, like the, the parents constantly tell that you have to found yourself, you have to found yourself and you have to know like what you want. I think kids are also very stressed about that because they have too many options on their tables and they get depressed. So I think we definitely need to find a balance between the, like these two educations. Yeah, that's very interesting. I think, I mean, I, I haven't looked into it. So and obviously, I typically don't look into like suicide rates and why. But I think maybe you're right is that it, it's that constant like theme of too many options that people deal with that, especially if you're a teenager, and you're constantly surrounded by comparing yourselves to everyone around you and trying to figure out who you are, it can also mm -hmm. be taxing, right? So I can imagine um, that there's just too much choice. And as like a child, maybe you need some sort of structure as well. Like, you don't need too many options or too much choice. What's interesting I find in the US, this is something that I faced because I was raised in Russia and we had a very strict um, education system where like um, I I was like, a we called it a five star, five star, five grade. So you get like a mark from one to five. I don't know how it is in China. Uh, five is like the best. And so like, if you're a fiver, then you obviously are very proud of that. But also what they used to do in the school is they used to embarrass us in front of our peers. So whatever mm -hmm. the result was for the test, they would call it out in front of everyone. So if you did badly, everybody would know. And so you want to save face. We also have that culture a little bit, I think. And so I remember uh, just like, the, the incredible respect that we had for our teachers we had to get up every time a teacher entered the room and just being really terrified of getting a bad mark and then I moved to Canada when I was 12 and I thought it was a joke I literally thought education in Canada was like camp you know like <laughs> nobody was learning anything everybody got a gold star for participation I was like but that's not what I you know that's not how I was raised like we had those values uh, mm -hmm. whether good or bad I'm not really sure to be honest but education was taken a lot more seriously. So you spent your childhood obviously being ta taught that uh, study hard, uh, don't date, don't date any boys. And uh, I think not really don't date any boys. Like my parents never restrict me that way, but I feel like I just don't really have time for dating. And mm -hmm. I never thought about dating, you know, because I was constantly thinking about getting good grades and there's just no room for me to think about another boy. And you know, you know what I mean. But my parents never really brought up the topic of dating or even sex education. So I think that part is definitely lacking, like, um, as my experience growing up in China. Yeah, tell me about that. How is that typically approached in China? I mean, like the conversation about sex, how do kids find out about it? I think I found out about sex when I found the condoms in my <laughs> In my in my how in my home back in China when I was maybe 
I don't know, in primary school or something. And my mom would just directly tell me what it is and what it's for. But I was very shy about it. And I don't really know, like, like what the heck is sex, you know, when I was in primary school for sure. And I think I just don't really want to talk about it. I don't know. Maybe I matured pretty late in life. So I was always like a very toy, like, to, uh, how to say, I was always a very tomboyish like girl when I was growing up. So I feel like that's just so uncool, you know, the relationships and everything, like the, the things that other girls do are just so uncool. So <laughs> I kind of, I have my own world. So I think my experience might be a little bit different, but I definitely feel like my mom was very honest, but I just don't want to talk about the topic. Interesting. I, I can totally relate. I was the tomboy as well. I remember my friends getting flowers. We went on a trip and my, my girlfriends at the time, they were getting flowers from these boys. And I, I, I didn't get any flowers. And I remember like going back to school and, and the girl that was getting flowers, she was like, yeah, you know, Marina never got any flowers. <laughs> so, such a, you know, you know how kids can be those, like when you're, when you're a child, like those yep. kind of conversations and then you realize, oh no, like nobody wants to give me flowers. But I was also a bit of a tomboy. Like I also didn't, I wasn't interested in that when I was a kid. So I can totally relate. Like everybody matures at their own time. So, mm -hmm. um, but typically like what is sex education like in China? How does that go about? Mm -hmm. I think we have classes like the science classes, but where the teachers are also very shy about it. You know, they would just, you know, give us the slides and then they would just say, oh, just watch it for yourself. And then um, I think just like that, it's like I think that part of the chapter especially is also not tested very heavily. So we don't really focus on that part. You know, it's more like a part. It's I think sex, sex education is just a part of the science class that you have to take, but it's not tested very heavily. So no one really cares that much. So they, they show you slides and then they say kind of figure it out on your own and they leave the room. Uh, they will teach us the basics but they will not really focus too much on that because it's not tested heavily. You know, that part mm. is just a part that you just need to know everything, but we don't really care that much about that part because it's not tested heavily on the test. We don't have a sex education class specifically for sex. We have a sex education class specifically for science class and we have to get tested on, on our tests. So that's where we learn our sex education. So I think a lot of times for us, it's more like figuring out on our own and or ask parents, but we don't really ask parents. It's just too weird for us. It's just so uncomfortable. That's for so funny though, that you say like, we don't have sex education for like understanding sex. It's more like, okay, how many marks is this gonna be worth on the biology test? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. That's pretty funny that like everything comes down to grades. Like no one, kids don't care about, maybe boys do, right? Maybe boys are more interested in that. Um, yeah, I, I would say, but I feel like, I don't know. Because for me, I was always very insensitive about this topic. You know, I was always very insensitive about relationships. Like if, I, if my friends, they're like hooking up, I, I would be the last one to notice because I genuinely don't care <laughs> and very insensitive about that. <laughs> yeah. But did you have any conversations in school kind of like with kids trying to figure out what is what and how things work? Because mm. usually in school, kids talk, right? Or they're trying to figure it out and then they'll spread some weird rumors. Like in my school, they yeah. used to say, if you have sex with clothing on, then you don't, you can't get pregnant. Like now <laughs> that I think back kind of, I'm like, where would that ever make sense? But you believe it because you have no yeah. idea. I think maybe the only thing that, okay, so I found the condom in my house and I brought it to, I actually, I brought the condom to school. And then we fill the condom with water and then we just sit around and watch it. That's probably like the one scene. And we just don't talk about the details. Like we never talk, I, for me personally, I never talk about sex with like my friends growing up, like never. But we do know what's going on, but we never really talk about it. Do you feel like it's a cultural thing or is that a you thing? I'm not sure. I think it's a cultural thing. 
But I definitely feel like the, the younger generation, like people who are younger than me, because I was born in 2000. So like there's people who were, who were born in like 2010. I think it's definitely a different scene because like my cousins who are 10 years younger than me, they're already dating. And yeah, they're already dating and it's parents are fine because they're getting good grades. I think the thing about like dating or sex in China, it's not like parents don't allow you to do that. It's more like they don't want you to be affected by dating or having sex to, you know, to affect your grades. Like if your grades are fine, they're fine. They're chill. <laughs> I think that's the case. So yeah. grades are number one priority. Everything else falls secondary, basically. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's interesting. And then you talked about something like the social clock for boys in China. What does that look like typically? Um, so from my videos, you know, so for boys, they just, they have to study very hard and go to a good college. And, um, I think the parents are fine if they're dating, you know, especially the boys' parents, they want the boys to date as much as they can to get that experience, you know, of dating and to kind of shape their personalities and to help them to become more responsible in life. That's what the boys' parents always think in China. And then they enter a good college and they generally want to get married around 30 years old. And definitely before 35, they want to have families, kids, wife and everything, and also a successful career. And I think for men in China, the social clock is definitely like after college, you just need to focus on your career, do everything you can to be successful, uh, buy a Rolls Royce when you're 50 or something like that, you know? <laughs> yeah. That's very interesting. So boys are encouraged to date because it's better for a boy to have more experience and girls are not, as you said, discouraged from dating, but that shouldn't be a priority, right? So boys yeah. should be more experienced, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And then, so something that I know is a big deal in China is um, for the man to have a lot of money while dating. Like he needs to prove his status to the woman. What do you think about this? Mm -hmm. I think this rule applies to everyone, like all around the world. It doesn't really only apply to China, but I think in China, it's very known, like well known for that is because I think our older generation has been through like poverty they don't have money. So they absolutely think that money is the most important thing in their lives because they never had them before. So I think it really gives us a very utilitarian culture where everything is very focused on like, you know, material goods are the most important thing and economic foundation is the most important thing. So which leads to men need to have money to date. And men need to pay every man needs to pay everything when you go on dates and get married. And I think that's just where like people think, yeah, like most people think like that, including myself. Yeah, I, that was actually my question to you. What do you personally believe when it comes to dating? Has that shifted at all since you've come mm -hmm. to the US? Obviously, US is still quite materialistic, but mm -hmm. has that changed at all for you? I think it hasn't really changed much for me because I always feel like, you know, I don't really like the, I don't really enjoy the conversation of like, oh, does man needs to pay for the first date? I don't enjoy that because why women get asked so much about this, you know, why can't you just ask men the same questions? It's the same thing as why people ask women about how do you balance family and career like we never ask men like how do you want to balance family and career because I feel like we're living in a patriarchal society like where everything men sets the standards for everything and we have to admit that because everyone in power are men and the leaders and they're all like men's so, like there are women's but they're only a very small percent of them are women. So we're living uh, so my point is that we're living in the extremely patriar patriarchal society where men have already taken so many advantages and women just need to fight for themselves. Like, of course we want men to pay for something because, um, because I think this is just a great gesture to do. But on another way, I also respect women who wa want to like split the bill for their first date. I think that for me, it's like women can do anything and set up their own standards. 
if you want them to pay, you can ask them to pay, and you don't have to be ashamed of being called like a gold digger or like being ashamed of being called a bad feminist. And if you don't want them to pay, then it's totally okay. You know, it's just women just can choose whatever they want. So that's my point. And do you then believe in some gender roles, or is it more that you just feel like men should pay and and that's it? Or do you believe like okay, if the man pays, and then I'm you're kind of raised with the idea that the woman should be then taking care of certain things? Um, to be honest, I'm still thinking about this because I'm. I think growing up in China, I definitely feel like in China, men just pay for everything, and they have to pay for the houses, they have to pay for、um, the cars and everything, and the women have to take care of the family, and take the fam like take care of the kids and the responsibilities in the family. But after I came to the U.S., my thoughts definitely changed a lot because if women can. Um, because I feel like women who spend a lot of time with their family responsibilities, they're not respected in the society. So, even though they have taken care of so much things in the family, but they're still not respected in the society because everything they do in the family are not valued in.、Um, They're just not valued in this patriarchal society because now people just value if you have a career, if you have money, if you have fame, but they don't really value their mom taking care of their kids at home. So that's why a lot of like Chinese women like me realize that even though men pay everything, you still need to have your own career and your own money for you to be respected in the society and to for you to found your values. So right now, I definitely feel like I still think that men should pay for everything, but I will earn my own money and get respected. <laughs> so you're gonna spend the money on yourself then. Yeah, <laughs> you're the men, definitely getting the American values. <laughs> and then men just spend it on me as well. Double income households. Yeah, because the original thing I mean with men paying, I I I, I totally、uh, can relate to that. In Russia, it's definitely the same, and that's how I was I was、um, raised as well. But I think that the idea in China and and back in like in Russia back in the day, maybe or maybe even now, is that if the man is doing that, then you're taking you're doing your part as a woman, right? So it's like a, it's not like just he's doing things for you; you're just taking it. I guess in China, I can I can sometimes feel like that as well, where like the man is doing everything and.、Um, Uh, I think there's some places in China. There's some cities where women are very much like expecting that to a very high degree as well. But yeah, I guess in the U.S. it's um it's very much that like nowadays it's like the man should pay for me, and that's it. <laughs> like I'm not I'm not bringing anything, and、um, there's nothing I'm bringing to you. Just pay for me, which is which is interesting. That's something I always wonder about as well.、Like、I'm not sure how I feel about the fact that we as women are kind of、mm -hmm. it, it feels like. In some ways, using guys to pay for us, but、mm -hmm. we're not willing to give anything in return. On the other hand, I do feel like men are also putting in way less effort these days.、Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm still also conflicted on that. Yeah,、uh, the best answer that I hear I heard from someone on the Chinese social media, like a housewife, like she's a stay-at-home mom. Like she said that one thing that I really agreed on. She said that there's no way that you can split bill with a guy. Because you just cannot let him、uh, pregnant for half of the time, and you get pregnant for half of the time, and you share the responsibility of like giving birth to a kid. So there's no way that you can split the things like financially, and there's nowhere in the world where men and women are equal. And I feel like a lot of times women, it's also for myself. Like a lot of times, I feel like I just think too much. You know, women just care too much. But the men, I think for most of the time, they don't care about that much. If they can use a woman, they just use it, and they feel fine, and they think that you know that's what the that's what the world is, you know. So I definitely feel like women,、um, new generation of women, we just start to think about a lot of deeper social issues that we want to tackle, but also、um, trying to embrace the fact that for decades, like. Chinese women are facing severe, like gender inequality problems, where they need to just take as much money as they can from their spouse because、um, there's there aren't much like you know 
job opportunities for them in the market. So they just don't, they don't, they cannot earn money for themselves. So the only way that they can is just to take money from their husbands. And their husbands are obviously enjoying all the benefits of the wife taking care of them. So that's interesting. I think, I mean, I definitely agree with you when it comes to China, but you still feel that in the US, there's still a huge inequality because something interesting that I've heard is that like even women that make a, a lot of money, they're like incredibly successful. They still want the men to be more successful, which I find interesting because I think in China, as you've said correctly, it's 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 been like women weren't making as much money as the men. So obviously because of that, you'll need the men to support you. But like nowadays we have a lot of really successful women making a lot of money and not wanting to have children either. There's a child-free trend as well, right? Mm -hmm. So they won't be taking care of kids. They probably won't be cooking or cleaning or they'll be working as well. So then do you feel like in the US it's a little bit different or do you still think it's it's relevant? I feel like a lot of times female elites, like female business people, they earn too much money, but they still cannot give up the hope that they want to find someone who earn more money and then someone to, you know, who are more successful and then they have to be servile to you. That's just like not going to happen, you know, and sometimes women who earn a lot of money, they're just torturing themselves by thinking they can find someone that earn more money than you. Like you're already making a million. Like, are you thinking about like, you know, finding people who are, who make like 10 million and still give you and who still like support you with that, you know, who still give you emotional support. I don't think that's how the world is. You know, I think men who are billionaires or like who are very rich, they want to found women who are servile to them and they don't want to found successful women. You know, they just want to found the one who are, who wants to be stay at home moms who want to take care of them and take care of their kids. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned the fact that if a man is a billionaire, he's going to be looking for a trophy wife, right? And mm -hmm. uh, someone who's who he's going to have some control over. Um, it, it, it's an interesting conversation I had with a girl, uh, a, a woman in her 40s mm -hmm. um, from Canada the other day. And um, she she was very much like she's the kind of girl that like she wants the guy to do everything for her. And I just posed kind of a question to her. I said, okay, so for example, what would you rather have um, a millionaire who you have no feelings towards that, you know, he's going to take you to the best restaurant, you know, fly you on his helicopter, whatever, whatever. Or would you rather spend that day with someone you genuinely really love that's not poor, but is not rich? And she's like, I don't have to choose. I'm going to have both. And I was like, mm, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> so I think maybe it's like, we feel like we can have it all. I think it's whatever you're comfortable with. I think at the, there's no like right answer, or wrong answer. If money is more important to you, then great, right? And But I think, I mean, for me, ideally, of course, it would be someone that has enough money because I think it's just attractive to have someone who has drive and who who can make a living, especially past a certain age, like past the age of 30. Um, that's just attractive, I think. But I think, you know, without getting too personal, I just wouldn't want to go to bed with someone that I'm not attracted to. So I think for me, that's also very important, you know, um, probably and not probably, but definitely more important for me personally. But again, for some women, that's not the case. And we definitely have a that tendency in, in Russia to look for, we say, oligarchs that mm -hmm. are, uh, you know, like incredibly rich men. And, and it's true. It's usually the countries that have suffered, suffered from like poverty or like gender inequality. Um, that's usually the case there. But yeah, anyways, going back to, <laughs> we completely swerved here, but I'm, I'm always interested to hear people's opinions, you know? Yeah. And yeah. But in China, definitely, like, there's also a trend, and um, I would love to hear your thoughts on it, of men not only paying for women, but even carrying their bags. Like, sometimes I've heard they tie shoes for, <laughs> for girls. So mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about that. Mm. To be honest, I feel like a lot of times we saw this kind of news, but we totally forget that China is a patriarchal society in nature. So a lot of the gestures that the men do is mainly to attract girls and let them become the wives and then let them do all the chores and take responsibilities for the family and do everything after. So I think a lot of times they may think like, men are willing to do this like very demeaning behaviors because they're great men. No, they're just doing this for the tactics. You know, they're just doing this for you to relax and 
they tell you that, oh, I'm the best man in the world. I'll tie your shoes. I'll do anything for you. Just become my wife and you'll be the happiest woman in the world. And then they marry them and then realized, oh, shoot, they're never going to clean anything at all. They're never going to clean the house. They're never going to do the things that they used to say they will do, you know. And a lot of times girls fell into that trap and then they marry someone who don't have that financial support and who are poorer than them. And they realized it's a trap because a lot of times men do this because they don't have anything else to support you. The only thing they can do is to do the little tactics. And yeah, I think a lot of times like in China, like definitely the, the social norm is to not marry someone who has less money than you, especially for girls. So you talk a lot about being a marriageable woman in China. Um, as you mentioned, you do this a little, a little bit ironically. So it's not, there's no like specific way that you have to be to get married. But are there certain pressures as a woman to be a certain way um, in order to be marriageable, in order to be, to be considered for marriage? For example, uh, someone has mentioned that having a PhD is going to work against you if you want to find a husband. Yeah. So in China, having a PhD degree is not going to stop you from finding a husband. But having a PhD degree at 30 years old will stop you from finding a good husband. Because in the, in the, Chinese, in the Chinese marriage market, all men care about the four and for, first and foremost is the age. So if you are not 25, under 25 years old, it will become a huge disadvantage for you to find a good husband in the market. So how old do you have to be then as a woman to be considered a leftover? Um, so I think around 30, like after 30 years old. But if you're after 35 years old, then just you're out of the market. You know, it's it's more like you don't have to consider about getting married anymore. Just to maybe have a child on your own is the best way for you. So what if you were married and you got divorced and you're, let's say, like 37? What would happen mm -hmm. then? I think that's actually better than women who haven't got married after 30. Like if you had a marriage before, then you would lower your standards and then you would actually find someone that's maybe also get a divorce before or who, who have like, you know, who are shorter or who earns less money because you already have a taste of what marriage is like before. So your standards will also go lower and then you're actually be more likely to find the guy that suits you well yeah that's so sad <laughs> <laughs> but like a lot of times i feel like marriage is a pretty sad thing from my perspective why yeah, so I, why do you think that because i don't know like growing up in china i just never see any parents who are genuinely happy maybe that's the point you know because for older generation of parents they don't really marry for love or anything they just marry because they're very compatible and they want to work together for the benefits of the family and that's how our grandparents were like my grandparents were married for like 50 years and but my mom still doesn't think like their marriage is good because she thinks it's very depressed as well <laughs> and most of like a lot of people around my mom's age they got divorced so I think that's probably why from my generation, when I see all these parents, I just feel like I don't want to be them. You know, I don't want to be a depressed wife at home, you know. So do you, th do you see like, kind of like a difference between the way Americans get married and the way Chinese get married then? I feel like the thing I notice about American family is like a lot of times they're very good with their st step parents like a lot of times the step parents would bring all the two sides of the families together and then they would have fun and i think that's such an interesting way of seeing like mod you know modern the how diverse modern families are but i think in china we definitely lack that diversity because if you get divorced in china and the two parents they would just hate on each other even though they say they would not but i definitely feel like they would just keep the distance and even though they remarried um other people 
they would not bring like the two big families together to go on vacations or anything. But I definitely feel like in America, people do that and they do it so well because they, I think they understand, you know, having a happy life is more important than people against each, you know, people go against each other because they hold that hatred in themselves. And, yeah. and I think Americans, they have much more relationships in their lives than you know, I think average Chinese people. And they understand that relationships are so fluid and they change all the time. And you just have to embrace that change and to live your life, you know, live a happy life without holding that hatred for your ex-boyfriend or for your ex-husband. But I think that part is definitely missing in China. But I do feel like as a younger generation, we start to realize that more and more. Yeah, that's very interesting. Is divorce considered a kind of taboo or do people get divorced easily? Right now, it's not a taboo. It's a common. Like right now, the I think the new social norm is just people get divorced and people don't want to get married in China and the divorce rate is just insanely high. Why do you think so? Because I feel like younger generation of women start to realize we've done too much for the family and the men are not appreciating what we have done for the family. Interesting. Mm -hmm. What do you think about marriage markets? Is that still a thing in China? Yeah, it's still a thing in China. For uh, anybody that doesn't know, tell us a little bit about what a, what is a marriage market. Yeah, so a marriage market, it's like a matchmaking market. So you would found an agent and who helps you to matchmake with other people. And they will just uh, gather all the information, your stats, like how tall, uh, your height, weight, income, family backgrounds, parents' occupations, your occupations, just everything. And then they will compare you with other people in the data set and then matchmake you with the people that suits you well. It's kind of like Chinese Tinder, but without the photo, right? Like, is the photo actually, is, do people use photos for this? Yeah, okay. people use photo for this. Yeah, just everything. Like, your appearance also matters. For women, I guess, more than for men, right? Yeah, 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 for sure. That's interesting. Yeah, I watched a documentary about the marriage market. And that's that's where I got the PhD thing, because one of them was like, oh, no, she's like over, she has too many degrees. <laughs> it's not going to go well for her. <laughs> I think that's just, uh, you know, I don't think the degrees don't matter. Obviously, they cannot say she's too old, you know, so they will say like, oh, she has too many degrees just to try to make it more subtle. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's true. Especially what, since we talked about good grades and like the kind of university you go mm -hmm. to are really important in Chinese culture. It would be strange that then being too educated would be a bad thing, right? Considering yeah. all of that. If you're 25 with a PhD degree, it will be such a plus for you in the marriage market. But if you're 30 with a PhD degree, that's the problem. What do Chinese think about the way Americans uh, date, get married? What do they think about it? Um, I feel like Chinese people definitely think that Americans are wild and they have too much relationships and they're just... Mm, I don't know, but but my my points also changed a lot after I came to the U.S. because I just feel like America is such a diverse country. You know, there are the conservatives, prudes who are exactly like the older generation of Chinese parents. They think uh, they think the things like exactly the same. They're the traditional wives, but there's also the new immigrants, newer people, LGBTQA communities. So I think it's just very diverse. Like from my perspective now since i lived in the u.s for a long time but maybe like ordinary chinese people would still think like americans are just wild and because they elected trump as their president <laughs> no, i'm joking <laughs> yeah. yeah but i think they definitely think americans have a lot of relationships and a lot of sex and yeah i think that's it do your parents, are, are they worried about you being in the U.S. and kind of becoming more wild as a process? Um, no, 
because I'm just way too prude. Like, <laughs> and sometimes my mom would definitely like feel worried about me not having men in my life. <laughs> and and I feel like it's very interesting because when I was younger and um, I'm, I haven't really dated anyone till I'm like 20 years old. So before I was like, before I turned uh, 20, maybe I'm like 18 or something. And my mom would start to worry that if I'm lesbian, you know, because for them being lesbian or being gay is more serious than you having too much relationships as a heterosexual person. <laughs> you know? That's super funny. Do yeah. you then want to get married? Like, do you feel then with that pressure, like to be married by 25? How do you feel about that personally? I feel like it makes, to be honest, like, I feel like it makes a lot of sense, you know, especially in China. If you want to look for someone that's really good and who has a decent family, decent income, decent everything, you just need to found that person before 25 because that's what the society is if you want to get married. But I think for me right now, I just want to focus on my career because I definitely feel like being able to have a good career and being able to build something on my own really excites me more than having sex or <laughs> being with a man. <laughs> you know, that I feel like every time, for example, I make videos and if it hits 20 million views and that's something that drives me nuts you know that's drive that makes me feel like oh like oh i'm so excited i feel so good about myself you know so i can totally relate yeah. <laughs> i can totally relate it's a bit addictive isn't it <laughs> yeah so i definitely feel like having your own career it's so addictive yes and i think a lot of women start to realize that as well yeah yeah but now you're 24 correct yeah, yeah yeah so you have one year typically <laughs> <laughs> for you to how does that make you feel i mean or are you just kind of like screw that i'm just gonna i don't care about those rules or and and are you going back to china are you gonna stay in the u.s i think this is also part of the reason why i want to stay in the u.s because it's just so free you know i think in the u.s you don't have to face all the social pressures obviously and you don't have to meet your aunties or uncles or relatives and to try to explain to them what's going on with your life. And I think that's why a lot of like Chinese immigrants, they just want to stay in the U.S. because the social pressure in China is just too big for them, you know, and it all makes sense. But I definitely feel like living in Shanghai is so comfortable. Like a lot of people who haven't been to Shanghai or Beijing don't understand this, but it's so comfortable to live in Shanghai or Beijing or like other cities in China. It's just so convenient. Everything is so cheap and you can get a takeout in two or three in the morning and you will get it like immediately. And there's just so much thing that you can shop in China. So like a lot of the Chinese immigrants were actually also very conflicted in the inside of whether we should go back to China or not. You know, because we definitely love the freedom and the American values in the U.S., but we also love how convenient and how, I don't know, how great life is back in China. Yeah, well, but it's interesting that you're saying that considering you live in the, what they say, the city that never sleeps, right? Which is New York. But I guess compared to Shanghai, which is like a city from the future, New York yeah. feels quite... <laughs> outdated right <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i think so i think it's all such a point of comparison as well like coming from shanghai i've never been to shanghai but i've heard some really amazing things about it and exactly what you said that you can get takeout you you can like everything is so instant and so quick and you can definitely yeah. be used to that one last thing i wanted to ask you uh before we wrap up is this concept of saving face in china which i think is quite important right? Mm -hmm. Have you felt it a lot in your life, this, this concept? Saving face? Yeah, I think there's a word for it in Chinese, but it's kind of like, not means. Yes, that's it. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I absolutely hate that concept. <laughs> because I feel like 
Yeah, we do. I think a lot of times Chinese people do things just for their face, you know, just for looking good. And I think that's why a lot of times uh, younger generations of Chinese kids have such a big conflict with their parents because we, as the younger generation, we definitely feel like our happiness, our individuality matters more than what other people think. But the older generation of Chinese parents, they definitely feel like they want their kids to have good grades, have good everything, have good, you know, just have a good husband or wife because they want to look good and they want to feel respected in the Chinese society. And sometimes that we cannot understand that. But in another way, um, I have to say that China is a collectivist society. So our value is that we have to sacrifice individuals' rights for the greater goods of the public. So a lot of times the Chinese parents would think that, you know, you just have to get it through, like get good grades, get good wife, get good husbands, and just for the greater goods of our family and to make our family proud. So I definitely feel like there's like a huge conflict in that part. And I think a lot of the Chinese Americans in the U.S., the Chinese American families where their parents grew up in China, they also have that conflict between like collectivism and individualism and between what the kids want and the, what the parents want. But I think genuinely, to be honest, at the end of the day, if you have enough money, the parents generally don't care who you are and what your sexual orientation is, what like what blah blah blah, like whatever you want to do. They don't care if you have en enough money. So money is the currency for everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Materials Material. is the currency for everything. Yeah, just a lot of times people like a lot of the times like Chinese parents they're just worried that you just you cannot earn money and you cannot get married with a good person. And you will end up having no money, and your life will be in shitholes. So that's what they worried about. And a lot of times they want to have, you know, a good face, like to look good on the face, because they just feel like, you know, if their kids don't have a good college, don't have a good husband, wife, or family, they don't have money, and the other relatives will laugh at them because oh, they'll say they will think like oh, they don't have money because they don't have good grades, because they don't have a good husband or wife, because they don't, they're they just doing some random careers that cannot earn them money. Wow. Well, that was, I think, a perfect way to finish this episode. Victoria, thank you so much. I've been a fan of your Instagram. <laughs> Uh, and I think it's, I, I first of all, love the format. I think it's really cool. And I love the little tidbits that I get every day on the Chinese culture. So guys, if mm. you want to check out Victoria's channel, I'm going to link to it below wherever you're listening to this or watching this. And um, I think it's something that you're not going to regret because you get a lot of information just from watching these fun, quick videos of hers. And I, and it's interesting talking to you because you obviously have the perspective of someone who was born in China, raised in China, and then living abroad now in the U.S. So you've had some time to really kind of internalize and think like, what is that Chinese mm -hmm. culture all about? And that's mm -hmm. why I love talking to people that have had that exposure to another culture mm -hmm. to really get a sense of their own. So thank you so much for taking part. Thank you. I really enjoyed this conversation. And I think for the last part, I just want to say like, my thoughts are also changing and evolving. And I think doing my channel definitely helps me to understand the world better and so thank you so much i really enjoyed this conversation with you thank yeah. you victoria and have a great rest of your day you and i are on the same time finally usually yeah. i'm like talking to people that are six hours ahead or 10 hours <laughs> ahead i'm like finally we're on the same time frame so have a good rest of your day and guys mm -hmm. stay tuned for another podcast where i talk about another culture bye bye